Hey guys, welcome to the Neglected Podcast. This podcast is not to change your mind, but to invite you into somebody else's narrative. This is a podcast to give a voice to the neglected. It is also an opportunity for all of us to engage. All right, what's going on, everybody? My name is Nick Schultz, and welcome to the very first episode of The Neglected Podcast. With me today, I got my producer, Quinn, over there. We are at City Church, and he's rocking the mic over there producing. Hey, hey, hey. And our first ever guest is my main man, Cornelius Lloyd. Cornelius, how you doing today, brother? Man, I'm doing well. So glad to be here with you all today. Why are you here, man? Man, I'm here because you asked me. Okay. (laughs) Yeah, so, be here. so we decided to do, I don't know if we really decided to do a podcast. It just all kind of came together. We got this idea. Somebody asked me, it's like, if you ever did a podcast, which I never wanted to do, what would it be? And I said, well, I'd call it the neglected and I'd interview people in our community, in our society that are being neglected and tell their stories, ask them questions, have them tell their stories. Lo and behold, get hooked up here with City Church. They got it all decked out to be able to do it. Man, this is phenomenal. It's pretty crazy, isn't it? It is. And then I had a designer guy who lives in Seattle said, hey, man, I love the idea. I'll design all that stuff for you. So there we got our logo behind you over there, and away we go. All of a sudden, we're doing it. We're flying away. So how did you and I actually get connected to meet? Because I still don't even understand where that first started. That's a great question. I I actually just said our kids. We got connected to our children. So um, your son and my daughter were in the same kindergarten class, I believe. And um, my wife was the class mom. And so we were able to connect through uh, our children and through education and PTA and main men. And here we go. Kids bring everyone together. Kids bring everything. I mean, the Bible says it, right? So kindergarten, that's where we got. We met in kindergarten. (laughs) Kindergarten. (laughs) Our kids met in kindergarten and therefore we met. And there we met. And that's been three years now. Already. Three years ago. Wait a minute. Yep. Kind of like that. Okay. With with the end of their second grade year. All right. I don't know what ages any of my kids are I right know. now. Well, see, you, you're called to all children. That's why. Okay. That sounds good. Yeah. We'll go with that. So, and then one of the other ways that we got connected was um, I got asked to help co-lead a men's dad's kind of group at our kids' elementary school called the Maine the Men because it's a lion theme. You know, Maine, get it? It's pretty Maine. Lions horny and cool. The, yeah, lions is the uh, mascot. But we'll kind of jump right into it why, why race matters because I got other – dads who are white that Mm -hmm. they could have easily joined and been kind of the co-leaders with me but purposely i was i wanted to have another dad who was not white to be able to co-lead because we have a very diverse school that our kids go to and so it was a strategic decision like to ask you to do that with me and i think it's been beneficial because we have a very diverse group of dads and men at the school and i don't know if that would have happened as well if it was honestly two white guys leading you know, thoughts on that, man. Well, I think you're right. I think, um, oh, look, first, first of all, I'm glad that I was able to be available uh, <laughs> to, to serve because what the reality is we have a lot of dads um, who want to be engaged, but work schedules, life uh, circumstances doesn't allow them to be at the table. And so um, coming from a home that has mom and dad in the home, I'm able to be a little, a little bit more available. And also whenever dads are not there, um, they're able to see someone that looks like them in a diverse environment of, of dads and students. Right. And part of the reason you and I kind of connected from the beginning was not just faith and background, which we'll get into here into in a second, but just seeking to help out younger people in our community and our society that are, are neglected. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and kind of what do you do and what was your background in that and what you're doing now? Well, I think we all have areas of being neglected, whether we like to acknowledge them or not. And so we are in a place in our society where we are kind of call to connect with those who are neglected, especially in our faith um, and working with kids and wanting to make sure that kids feel welcomed and feel loved and feel embraced by those around them. And sometimes um, I've been called to those who are on the fringes of of ministry. So for about uh, 10 years now, I've been in uh, youth ministry in some capacity, starting as a volunteer, uh, served full time in ministry in the uh, metro Atlanta area as a minister of youth, young adult and college students. Um, Prior to that, worked with kids whose parents were incarcerated and that's where um, I acknowledge more of my call to serve. And those are children who are um, 
normal kids with abnormal situations with the loss of a parent who's incarcerated and um, they're imaginary kids. So you don't really see them because they don't wear their circumstances. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I guess part of this is the call of the, the, the call to the neglected. Um, and so I always wanted to be the bigger brother that I did not have. And so that's where I approach uh, mentoring, ministry, uh, re-entry work, wanting to help to motivate, empower other other folks um, to be more than what they are. So let's jump into that then. The bigger brother that you didn't have. Mm -hmm. Let's let's kind of take it back a little bit to your your childhood, where you grew up, how you grew up, and your family dynamic, and why that kind of molded you, and the areas that you were neglected, mm -hmm. and and why you want to do what you're doing now. Yeah. So um, born and raised in Savannah, Georgia. Um, at Candler Hospital. And uh, mom and dad have been married uh, my whole life. So I came from a two parent home. Um, and my parents did not come from two parent homes. Um, my mother and father uh, in their faith and their desire to wanna have a, a better upbringing for their own children made some very strategic and intentional uh, decisions for my sister and I. So I'm the older of two. My sister is uh, two years, two months and a day younger than me. And um, we always joke about that. She's uh, she's not very close and she lives in the uh, Philadelphia area now. But um, my mother was a first generation college student. My father was a first generation college student. Uh, and so education was a big key uh, to our development. Uh, my grandparents um, also uh, left resources for my sister and I to gain education. So we um, further our education by going to get master's degrees also. And so uh, we are the family that just kept moving forward, uh, kept trying to uh, be better than the previous generation. And we're still striving to be that because we still are trying to figure that out <laughs> in this millennial world of um, development. So, uh, but we have a large extended family. And so uh, my father comes from a family of one of 10. My mother is one Ooh. of eight. Yeah, so they, they're having babies. So that means our first cousins are like <laughs> a lot of people. Um, but also there's this huge diversity that shows up um, amongst uh, race, socioeconomic class, even amongst our family. Uh, we were at a family reunion some years ago. And so um, my family's African-American, but uh, we have the whole rainbow uh, coalition of folks in our family. And so we were sitting in the lobby of this hotel in DC and uh, some folks walked by and we're all sitting on top of each other and sitting on sofas and laughing and talking. Oh, you all are here on a vacation for, for school? No, we're here for the family reunion. <laughs> you have some confused looks. And um, family reunion? Yes. And so I'm the spokesperson. We all have the same grandmother. <laughs> so we have uh, persons of um, Asian ethnicity, uh, Japanese, German, uh, Swedish um, ethnicities. Uh, we all have different religions. And so we are this welcoming melting pot of people who love each other. And uh, our commonality is mm -hmm. our African-American grandmother that was born uh, Defusky Island, South Carolina. So if you know anything about Defusky or Gullah Geechee culture, no. uh, Gullah Geechee, we'll see what we're going to learn today. So Gullah Geechee Quinn, culture, you, you know I about don't, that? I you don't. Know? Okay. Oh, so great. I can, I can share this with you all. So Gullah Geechee culture are those persons who uh, came from um, slavery, but also have a strong sense of their African roots. And so they're able to, they were able to hold on to a lot of their traditions. And so my grandmother comes out of that tradition, um, not too far from here. So Hilton Head, Defusky Island, those areas, um, or where folks settled. And so um, this year, my grandmother will be 90 years old. Nice. So we have a close family. And, and so that is all a part of the neglected because those people on those islands now um, are being pushed off their land. Uh, there's a lot of commercialization and development going on in those, area, those areas. And so um, we come from that, from those people who kind of have uh, been able to uh, pull themselves together, maintain their, their culture. That's a beautiful picture there. It actually looks like uh, it's, the nation actually spans from a good bit from uh, North Carolina mm -hmm. all the way down to Florida, it says. Mm -hmm. Yep, and so we, if you see right there where that star is, that is where we hail from. The Fusky Islands, South Carolina. It's ground zero for you, huh? That is, that is. All right, so your grandma, how far back can you trace your family lineage or your, your ancestry? Well, I haven't done the research yet, so that's my to-do list. I have done it on my dad's side of the family. So my dad's side is not from the same uh, culture of people, um, but on his side of the family, we've been able to go far back as, I believe his great-grandparents. Uh, so for me, that'd be my great-great-grandparents. Maybe our great-great-great-grandparents so far. So we, we had a reunion last year and I did a lot of the ancestry. 
Gotcha. Yeah. So I want to go back to a point before we kind of bring all those kind of intersections of neglect when you were growing up and together. And, you know, you mentioned school and how important education was. And I'm interested to get your feedback on what life was like, because, you know, for some people, black community and education, and you get throw the word like privilege around and you you get opportunities to go higher in education, depending on where you're from and who your friends are. How was that looked upon and what was that experience like based on, you know, your community, your friends and, and where you went and how? I think that it helped me and my sister to be very well-rounded individuals um, because there is a section of my family that doesn't have those kind of uh, degrees or education or um, it may not have had those resources. My father was uh, a basketball standout here in Savannah and he went to his mom. This is a woman raising uh, 10 children by herself because my grandfather passed away at the age of 35 years old. Um, my father was two, so he didn't know his father um, mm -hmm. outside of um, the memories he had as a toddler. And so, but but my grandfather taught a lot uh, in the home, even though he was not um, academically trained, but there was a desire in him for his children to, to have that, that background, that education experience. And so my father, uh, went to his mom and said, hey, mom, I found out a way to go to college. And she, her response was, oh, OK. <laughs> it, education was not on her radar. Right, it, was, right. it was pretty much take care of you, make sure you're safe, make sure you have what you need. And, um, and then when you get to be 18, you can go in the military like your uncles did, or you can go and get a trade like your brother did. But education in that realm was not something that um, she saw or imagined for her own children. And so he had to dream a dream that was um, unknown mm -hmm. and uh, unseen by even his parents and, and his siblings. So he goes off to school. Um, he's a basketball player and it pays for his education. And that's the springboard that kind of changed the traje trajectory of his life. Um, my mother was the same way. Mother was reared as the only child, but she was one of eight. And uh, she goes off to school and she's going year round um, to school and the older people in the family are like, we don't know what she's doing, but she's doing something really good. And she's um, one of the uh, first African-American uh, women to, uh, amongst that first generation of, of women to go to uh, UGA to get her undergrad, I mean, to get her graduate degree. Wow. So, um, so that was ingrained in us, mm -hmm. um, but it also did not leave us without the touch of family. Um, these are the people that love you, they care about you, they feed you. Uh, they will look out for you. They protect you. And um, so that experience for us uh, never disconnected us from where we had come from as a people, um, as a family. Yeah, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. So when when did you start realizing kind of what age or time in life that you realize like racial issues or neglect and in, in people in our society or community? That that's not right. That doesn't make sense. Or you personally experienced it as well. Yeah, I mean, I think you know one one of the things I, I shared with a coworker recently, maybe in the last two years, uh, race and racism is a fabric that makes up America. It's just what it is. As much as many people may not want to talk about it, I mean, everyone's not like you, Nick, where you can talk about this and put it on the table. Uh, but there's some people that want to kind of avoid that it is a real issue. And so for me, it uh, came across very early. Um, I switched elementary schools um, my third grade year. And um, when I switched, I was in a more diverse environment, meaning there were more white people, um, more people of different socio socioeconomic status, um, folks that grew up in the projects or being raised in the projects. Um, I was in the gifted and talented program. And so I began to uh, learn that there was some disparity and treatment, but I couldn't really name it. My, now my father was able to name it for me. <laughs> and so I, I didn't really understand what was happening, but um, I was greeted by this wonderful white lady named Miss Wilbur. She was my third grade teacher. And she made sure that all the kids knew that there's a new guy named Cornelius in the class. And matter of fact, to this day, I still can remember the very first phone number that I got from um, one of the students who was uh, gracious to give that to me. Um, so that I have a friend. And ironically enough, I met my wife my third grade year when I transitioned to, to the school. Hmm. Um, but we had these, uh, we had white women teachers um, who loved education, were really passionate about it. Uh, everything was cool third grade, um, but then something changed in the fourth grade. And um, we had four or five of my um, black boy uh, friends who were all in the same class. And then by the time we got to fifth grade, we were down to two. And um, I did not understand what was really going on. And I had a black teacher who was um, 
really checking off the boxes of her success and would not necessarily engage us in, ex in uh, external uh, research opportunities. And so I had this book and I said, I want to read this book about these presidents who have um, black ethnicity in their lineage. No, we don't have that. And she went and she wanted to prove me wrong. And so my father came to the school and said, um, when a student wants to learn more outside of the classroom, we embrace that. We don't discourage them. And this is a black woman. Wow. Um, but because she was checking the boxes off. And sometimes uh, there are times when African-Americans feel like we shouldn't focus on race. We should just do a good job and we should get our paycheck and we should live our lives independent of what's going on around us. And so we don't bring up issues of race. We just do our quote unquote good jobs um, to kind of keep the peace around us. And that's what I experienced. Um, so my experience around race race and race relations uh, came in very early. Um, and so I was very aware of my blackness and even my, my maleness. Well, Sorry. before we go on to the next question, can you please tell everyone your, your full name? That's so my full government name is Cornelius Jamar Ephraim Lloyd. Ephraim. Or Cornelius Jamar Ephraim or Cornelius Jamar Ephraim. Oof, man. Yeah, Lloyd. I would completely be going with Ephraim. So funny thing is that I actually walked across the stage at Georgia State University as Cornelius Jamar Ephraim. Ooh. They forgot the Lloyd. Really? Yeah. That is the weaker name of all that, I'll, I'll be honest. <laughs> you can't say that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry to your family, but to follow Ephraim with I mean, Lloyd, it it, is, that's, that's it, rough, man. You're right. It is kind of you know a major thing. I mean, if I had a pet tiger, I would name it Ephraim. Pet, well, I like tigers. My son likes tigers. It's my tigers. favorite animal. I don't think I'll ever have a pet tiger. So maybe like a, a dog, a Great Dane, or a Mastiff or something. I name it Ephraim, but definitely yeah. pet tiger. We had a bull Mastiff in our family. Rest in peace, boss. Interesting. All right, Ephraim, let's continue. Now, this could be my, uh, my name. For the rest of this interview, yes, <laughs> Ephraim. <laughs> Such authority behind what you say now, <laughs> knowing yeah, that your name is Ephraim, yeah. All right, so let's go to... You lived in Savannah, mm -hmm. you moved away to Atlanta, you came back to Savannah. What was the kind of the racial differences between when you left, what you saw there, and then kind of what's happening now, and then we'll kind of go from there a little bit. So um, as I shared earlier, I went to a more diverse uh, elementary school, which kind of set the trajectory of all my educational experiences from that time forward. Um, so from elementary, middle, high school, and college, all in ended up being very diverse, um, but, uh, while Georgia State University was a uh, PWI, a predominantly white institution, there was this influx of um, minority students that uh, came on campus. And I used to joke and call it the, the new black college university um, because there were so many people out front. Um, we have HBCUs, which are historically uh, historical black college universities, but I just tagged Georgia State as such. And so uh, student council, student government was all read, led by African-Americans. A lot of African-Americans on the plaza outside in the, um, the gathering place. And it was a heavy commuter school. And that's where we picked up a lot of the um, predominantly white population from those that were commuting from home into the institution and going back home. And so um, many of the environments that I found myself in were a lot of uh, African-American people. And then when I got to uh, seminary, I went to a predominantly white seminary, so much so that there were only seven African-American men in the program. And a friend of ours, or she later became a friend, said, uh, you all need to be reminded that a lot of eyes are on you all. You're located in this community where there are not a lot of you all. And so continue to keep your eyes and your ears open to all that is going on around you. Um, there were conversations internally amongst the staff. Well, we have more African-Americans than we've ever had before. Should we send over all their pictures to the local de police department no. to let them know that they're here, that oh you all goodness. are here? Are you... I'm sorry, that they are here because I wasn't a part of this conversation. Mm. Are you kidding me? Oh, no, it's, it gets better. And so uh, they said, no, what we'll do is we'll just send over the entire class. So we'll send pictures over of the entire class to the police department and they will notice that there are more African-Americans on our campus. Uh, there was a organization on campus called um, Black Seminarians Association. Um, it was to meet the needs of African-Americans and Blacks. Well, we had a lot of international students who don't identify as Black. They don't identify as um, Americans. And so 
they felt like it was derogatory term. It was something that was placed on uh, former slaves in America and they didn't want to identify with that at all. It wasn't until they faced racial profiling on the campus that they then began to identify with what blacks have been going through and have been talked about, had shared with them. And so while they didn't want to be a part of that, they found themselves being black. And so the term black just in general is something that is a, can be considered a neglected term. It wasn't until James Brown came out with I'm black and I'm proud, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud, that the African-American community jumped on that because you had all the different labels that were associated with that. So, um, you know, we're in Georgia, we're in the South. This is where you have um, a lot of racial uh, tension, but also what we consider racial progression. Um, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. during the Civil Rights Movement came to Savannah, uh, interviewed with local um, radio personalities and radio shows and TV shows and considered Savannah to be more progressive in the civil rights movement. Um, later to understand that the word progressive can also mean um, a lot of destruction and a lot of assimilation, a lot of loss of identity amongst the black community. Uh, so it depends on who you're talking to and talking with about uh, race relations and racial disparity and racism, what their take on it would be. For me, being um, someone on the cusp of Generation X and the millennial generation, I like to refer to myself as a Xenial. So this is someone in the midst of the transition. Did you of, just make that up? It's actually an article. I can't take credit for it. So I would love to, but it's not my turn. Oh, do your but, thing, Ephraim. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's persons who were born somewhere around 1977, 78 through like 1983, 84. And so this is the generation of people who have seen every kind of uh, technological breakthrough, right? So you've seen, we had grandparents had record players and eight track players, and then you had records and vinyls and CDs and digital downloads. We've seen the the progression of technology and can kind of adapt to any, any way of, um, any mode of communication. So what's the progression of Savannah then from when you left to when yeah. you came back? Wait, that's a great, great segue. Um, for me, I had to learn and my goal was, okay, when I go back to Savannah, I'll learn of a Savannah I did not know. Uh, and so I left at 17. I came back at 33, there about 34. So at this time, I now have a wife. I have a child. I have two children. I have godchildren. So learning how to figure out what's going on. And, and quite honestly, I've been back for three years now and I'm still trying to figure out what's going on. We in the we've come from the era of President Barack Obama and now we're in the era of President uh, Donald Trump, who can be seen as uh, someone in our history who is very divisive. Um, Huge. Yeah. And so we have this era of time where folks were very um, excited about President Obama, but then there was an entire group of people who were very irritated with that administration. And so many people would say, we didn't have, our racial issues were under control until President Obama became president. And then you have a set of people that said, we have seen some of our best years since the Obama administration, and now we're in this terrible time of President Trump. So it just depends on who you're talking about, what their perspective is on what's happening. And we see a president who operates in neglecting a lot of people, just separating a lot of people. And we saw it at our borders. And while a lot of these things are political and um, rooted in certain person's truths, what took place at the border with uh, immigrants that wanted to have a better life um, is something that is can be considered inhumane when you have children who are separated from parents and put in um, gated, caged areas and not to be reclaimed. And so you ask, what is the progression of Savannah? During the time that I was away, we went from having um, African-Americans in major leadership roles. Um, I think it was during that time that we saw the first district attorney, first African-American district attorney in the history of Savannah. And so a lot of leadership changed over, but a lot of leadership also went back under um, white leadership. And so we had um, Mayor Otis Johnson, Mayor Edna Jackson, and now we have um, Mayor Eddie DeLoach. 
And so many people are wondering, will we ever be in a position of leadership again? Even amongst our criminal justice system, we had a demerger in our police department where we had Savannah Police Department and Chatham under one, and now they've been uh, demerged. Right. And the leadership amongst uh, those uh, different areas of government are now white leadership. So, you know, what what is the progression? I'm still figuring it out. I think um, we're all figuring it out. Yeah. But I think one of the interesting thing is for you and I, we both care about having conversations with people about it. Mm -hmm. Because regardless of who's president, who's the mayor, who's in charge of the police department, who's a pastor of what church and what area, who's school administration, regardless for racial things to change, you know, we've talked about this, it's, it's a hard issue. So it doesn't matter what kind of law somebody makes, it doesn't necessarily matter what somebody, you know, whether they're famous or they have authority over us like a president or somebody else says, you want them to say things that are helpful, not hurtful, and, and pass laws that are helpful, not hurtful. But as far as like people in general, something has to happen inside where they have to, to do something. And that's where you and I kind of talk a lot and try to get engaged in the community of having conversations like this and what can people actually do. Let's, let's push that a little bit too. Let's consider that our hearts will affect our policy. And so if we have, a, if people or persons begin to develop a different heart for race relations, then those things will trans, translate into our policies and our politics. And um, you'll have someone who's able to say, well, I do have a heart, but I also understand the law. And they'd have to spend time with that person too, which is such a big deal. Yes. Now, one of my favorite quotes is empathy requires proximity. Mm -hmm. So you are not truly going to care for somebody unless you are around them. You're having a conversation and you're learning about them. And to me, this is the big, big pain that I have is that it doesn't matter who it is. I mean, just look at segregation too. And you can speak on this because you're, you're really smart and educated about all these, this history of all this. Okay. You can pass a law, boom, segregation's over. But did that change anything besides what a law was and what that did that do to any, anybody's hearts? Was there healing? Was there people coming together and say, okay, how do we mend all of this pain and all this brokenness? Or do we just go, yep, it's good. Hey, the law's changed, so let's all move on, which is kind of how the country was set up to move forward. And people wonder why is there all these race issues? Because there's, there's no healing. Because there's no healing. There's no healing. <laughs> there was nothing. I mean, we move forward sometimes to have quote unquote better opportunities, but what, what is a better opportunity? What is, what is success? What does that, what, how, you, how do you define that? And I think those are some hard questions, some very hard, hard questions that we have to consider. How do you talk to your kids about race well, in their current context right now? Like, what do you tell them that I wouldn't tell my kids that they need to know about, look out for. I mean, I, I try to tell my kids about what other people experience and how they need to be the ones to step up. And if you ever hear this or see this, like this is wrong. Like, and you're not just to look away and it doesn't matter. Like you're supposed to step up and do something. But as far as if that was my kid who was black or Latino or something, who's being the one discriminated against and whether it's a police thing or a class thing or, you know, what, what do you tell them? Well, part of our, um, the way that we approach it is, uh, we use television to be a springboard. So there's there's certain shows that exist. Um, first of all, there are not a lot of shows that, that exist that um, have great representation. I think in the era of Black Panther and um, Marvel, being able to open up a conversation around race. Wakanda that, forever, man. I mean, yeah, <laughs> Wakanda changed everything because we, <laughs> we haven't seen anything. And while it's in fiction and it's in uh, comic world, the conversation now has changed in a way that it was not. So, I mean, one of the things about Blackish, which is a uh, which shows on ABC mm -hmm. and um, Anthony Anderson and uh, what's the other actress name? It just left me. Just go with it, man. Yeah. So that show was actually um, they had to put some of their own money behind it in order for it to get um, for it to come on air. But it shows a black family um, of a particular socioeconomic status. They have means, they have money, right. but they still have issues that are specific to the black family. 
And so we we use those shows as conversation. Tracy Ellis Ross, thank you. There you go. Master producer. <laughs> cool. So Tracy Ellis Ross and Anthony Anderson are two African-American actors and actresses who've been in the game for a long time. This is not their first run at the rodeo here. And uh, so they have used their money to begin to uh, tell the story of a well-off um, family, but they have they have the, the, the dad that lives with them, the mom lives with them, her parents um, uh, live there and she's biracial, multi, multi-ethnic. And so we use those kinds of shows to springboard the conversation around race relations in our home. And we use terms like brown and um, brown kids. And we want to make sure that we we also are trying not to put our own issues on our kids, right. but also speak to the reality that they live in of working hard, um, speaking up for themselves, not allowing anybody to um, to tease them or speak down on them. And what's we're still, because they're so young, there's still some things we want them to see for themselves versus us telling them how the, how things are. Man, and, yeah. uh, you know what made me sad one day? Mm-hmm. My This is my oldest son. It was probably, when were our kids together? Kindergarten. kindergarten. So yeah, it's in kindergarten. He's at, he's at our school. And the way he would talk about skin color was just what he thought the skin color was. Mm-hmm. It wasn't black and white. Mm-hmm. It was, hey, I, I played a recess with my brown friend. Mm-hmm. Or like uh, we, I ate lunch with uh, my friend, he, dark brown, mm-hmm. you know, dark brown or peach. You know, he called himself he was peach. He's peach. He never used white or black at all until he got in about second grade, mm-hmm. and then he came on and started talking about. And it wasn't in any kind of negative connotation or anything, but it was just now the the language was there, as opposed to just that childlike. This is how I see it. And there was no no thought about that kind of stuff. And then that worldly language kind of got in his his vernacular, just yeah. like it is everybody else's. But it was it was kind of a sad thing for me, where he wasn't taken a bad way. <laughs> but for me, I was like, oh man, it was cool when it wasn't just this or just this. There's so much in the middle. Nobody really is actually all white or all and, black. And that's because we don't really acknowledge the racial construct. Uh, I mean, not the race, but the societal con- construct of race. Um, where those persons who are considered white are European persons, but there's a shift in the census where folks who are of Irish and Swiss descent, where they became, they were they were black. And then all of a sudden the census showed them as white mm-hmm. uh, because the skin color was more comparable to what the definition of white was versus what black was. I have a funny story about my niece. So my, my niece, uh, <laughs> was at school and her mother went to tour the school with her and so she asked the principal of the headmaster at school so how many other brown girls like me are there and they said that's a really good question and she said because i saw one uh-huh. <laughs> and so she was able to be very she's very self-aware even at six seven years old to ask the question maybe she was five but she was at, to ask the question is there anyone else here that looks like i do and there was a moment when she got teased by another kid um, and the kid said, well, you can't play with us because you're black. And she says, I don't know what you're talking about because I'm not black. I'm brown. <laughs> <laughs> and she turns away and walks away because she's very confident in right. who she is. Right. She sees her mother as a role model, her aunts, her grandmothers, and she's loved and affirmed by her father and her uncles. And so she has, she's very secure in who she is. I think that's part of why why I answered the question the way I did is that my children need to be secure in who they are. And that's one of the reasons why we relocated back to Savannah is because we have, um, they have four grandparents that are here and their aunts. And so they're in an environment where they can be very much self-aware and secure and loved in who they are so that when the enemy of racism is introduced, they're not wiped off the map of their security and their self-image and their uh, self-esteem because they're okay. What's the difference between using African-American versus black? It just depends on the moment of my brain that I'm in. <laughs> so so I, that's for me, that's my answer. Um, African-American was given so that we are, it connects us with the continent, the culture right. and the people and the origin of who we are. Um, 
And it's the same way you see when people use uh, the term either Asian American or Korean American or Japanese American, it connects them with their place of origin. Um, that I've, I've had several conversations recently with uh, some good friends about, um, as a matter of fact, we had a conversation um, at your home once mm -hmm. about visiting a place of origin, uh, mm -hmm. ethnic place of origin, and people asking you, well, where are you from? Right. And you say, I'm from New Jersey. I'm from Georgia. I'm from Savannah. No, where are you from? And so people around them will say, well, I'm from Nigeria. I'm from Ghana. Um, I'm from Jamaica. And so they have these places of origin that they may come from. And you say, yep, my place of origin is Savannah. Or my place of origin is California mm -hmm. or Sacramento. But being able to uh, identify with the continent gives some strength and credence to your identity. So you use African-American in that term. And then some folks use black because, like, like I said, James Brown celebrated it. There's a culture associated with it. There's pride. And even now there's a, a social media movement and language around black excellence uh, to say that African-Americans, black people, we can present well, we can be educated, we have money and businesses and our families are wholesome, we have love to give, and we care about people holistically. So what about the phrases, like when you hear somebody say colored people or person of color, are those two different things um, in our culture or do they mean the same thing? Is one of them offensive or both of them offensive? What do you think? So I think um, colored, is a term uh, that can be used as a term of, of uh, a demeaning term, a derogatory term, um, but it also is a place of history. Mm -hmm. So we're not gonna re erase history, but that was a term that was used to identify a group of people, but it was given by the majority, cult majority culture um, as many of the terms that we see are given. And so um, this, is, this comes from the era of white fountains are uh, white only and colored only it wasn't black only right. and as language and politics has changed we want to lump everyone together to say people of color mm -hmm. and so everybody's a person of some color right but we but society has lumped in people of color to identify blacks latinos uh person that come from other countries and so we can say brown people because mm -hmm. that's another term that's being used now is uh right brown bodies or black bodies. Who's allowed to use the N-word? Oh man, you're going all the way in today, huh? I am. So the term, it, as as every term of um, that we've discussed, colored, Negro, black, African-American. African-American may have been the only term that African-Americans actually came up with. And this is during uh, the time that Jesse Jackson was very heavy in politics. So, <laughs> We've taken every term and made it something possibly of unity, possibly possibly of empowerment. So who can use the word? Nobody should use the word. <laughs> you it's, know, and so there's a difference the, of like it, your it, personal opinion versus possibly culture that you're around. Oh yeah, it's a whole it's a whole culture around it. So it showed up in it showed up in gangster rap, which was the story of gang culture in um california so it shows up there in our culture um and then over a period of time you and then that's that's a the ending with the a then you have the ending with the er which is coming from slave plantations right. and the mistreatment of people so it's a term that is very painful it is very hurtful a very offensive term and then you have another culture that says uh that comes at it from a different angle drops the ER, adds an A, and then it becomes more palatable for folks to say without the pain. But then there's a generation that's older that says, we don't care if it's with the A or the ER, it shouldn't be used because, it, because of the pain that it represents, the evil that's behind it. See, some of the some of the guys I mentor, because I, I haven't talked about it yet, but I mentor young men ages like 15 to 25 for a living. Mm -hmm. And you know, I've got some black, some white, some in between. And I don't think much about it when the black young men, they use it because I view it as part of their culture and they speak that all the time. I'm not going to go, hey, stop, hey, stop, hey, stop. Maybe I don't like it necessarily all the time, but they're talking within their current context and their culture. Mm -hmm. But then I've had you know a couple of white students I've worked with before too, where they use the A on the end and they're talking about those friends in school who, you know, their homies, you know what I mean? Like that. But I still don't, I don't like that at all. It's like, man, you shouldn't be using that at all. Mm -hmm. 
and your friend might like it, but outside of like your your friend circle, like I don't know if that's gonna fly in in the the community. You know what I mean, if you mm -hmm. say that around someone who isn't your friend that's black, it's not gonna end well for you. <laughs> and I think that's good advice. <laughs> and I think you should probably discourage them from using it because I, it's people still argue on the validity of the culture. And I think we live in this world. Um, we live in a world of definitely uh, reality. We live in these ideologies of how we would like things to be. Um, but based on what it is, it's probably safe to stay away from some of those languages. I mean, it's just like using words in front of your parents. There's some certain things you won't say in front of your parents. And so I think that we have to um, understand what is decent and what is in order and what is acceptable. Something I'm interested in getting your opinion about is, uh, <laughs> we've talked about this too, is uh, social media and oh joy yeah here we go when when stuff happens especially when it's you know political it's a presidential thing it's um something like ferguson it's a white cop shooting a unarmed black man but there's all these these people you know the social media opinions that that come out and you know i i have a real problem with them what sometimes some of my white friends will even put on social media because you got people trying to defend certain people, um, get their point of view across, say, I'll wait till all the facts or don't this, you know, people are just saying stuff all the time. And the one thing that bothers me the most is that when white people don't realize some of the things that they do put on social media and share how it affects their, their black friends or maybe their, their Latino friends, especially if it's like a border issue. And the one question I always ask, if I think it's out of line, it's just like, in a personal way, you know what I mean? Don't put it on a post or something, but it's like, hey, did, did you talk to your Latino friend about that before you posted it or get their opinion? Did you sit down with your black friend and talk with them about, you know, what you were thinking about, you know, posting on race? And the answer is almost always no. So I ask you as a black man, what you see on social media and things that some people post, especially white people, and how does that actually really come across? And, and how does that make you feel? Or other people that you're in circles with that makes them feel. We had an experience in seminary where one of our colleagues uh, presented a, a project and um, it was just totally um, offensive and derogatory. And so we had to meet with them, meet with this, the uh, professors, meet with the president of the uh, institution. And so um, and then we had another situation in my life where we had a relative who went on a social media rant um, and what I think is challenging is when people do not understand and white people understand the privilege that they have. So there's a set of privileges that, that we as African-Americans our black folks do not have. We can't exercise, we can't earn our money, earn our way out of it to get the privilege. Um, and so what happens is when information is conveyed or presented amongst, amongst white people, it's because I have the privilege or the authority to say these things as it is without consideration for the people that I'm attached to. And also it becomes just like you said, black friend or Latino friend. What happened to my friend that is Latino or my friend that is black? Because we put the label of who they are and then the friend on the back end of it as if it qualifies that they're my friend, but they have this ethnicity. It's almost like the same the same statement. Oh, I'm not racist because I have black friends. Do you really have black friends or do you have a friend that happens to be black or is that just your designated black friend so you can say whatever you want <laughs> right so, yeah. you can say, so you can say i'm not racist no you're still racist but you're a racist with a black friend you can be you, you can say oh i'm not sexist because i have women no you're just you're sexist and you have women that are friends <laughs> that's so good man yeah <laughs> so i think i think every group of people has to have a set of standards that they operate under so whenever i see a younger cousin or maybe a younger mentee who's going on a social media rant about something, I will inbox them and say, hey, that's not representative of who I know you to be. That's not the image that you want to give other people about who you are. Even though you may be angry, you may be justified in being upset, but this is not how we conduct ourselves. Would you consider removing that? And nine times out of 10, I'm pretty successful in saying, <laughs> in getting them to remove whatever this post is that they've made. When it comes to adults, um, there are times when, uh, I think one time I had something on my wall and it just went, crazy i mean just all these responses i deleted the whole post um and deleted everything and, and said no this my my wall won't be used 
for your personal agenda, whatever that may be. Yeah. Do you think at all that the PC culture uh, that's kind of going around, especially with the internet and social media today, do you think that it at all has a negative effect on issues like racism or uh, sexism, different stuff like that? Uh, PC culture? Yeah, politically correct culture. So one of them uh, that I had recently uh, happened to me, I, I posted on Facebook a picture of the, the woman that led the team that captured the picture of the black hole uh, a few weeks ago and um, somebody kind of jumped on me for doing it saying that this is you know some kind of like sexist whatever these are people trying to push like this girl up to the front instead of giving credit to the whole team and you know he kind of tried to make a big deal about it assuming that that was my uh, my agenda and then I was just like hey man I just like posting cool stuff <laughs> you know and so if she's the one that supervised it it's you know, I'm fine with her picture being on the front and the one that I, I, you know, and so I was curious as to how um, reaction from uh, really, it's I think it's smaller groups, you know, that that just kind of get blown out of proportion. Do you think that that has a negative effect on issues like racism and social media? I, I think, yes, it does have a, um, a negative effect on those issues and also keeps us from being at the table to have real conversations about what's going on. Um, there are, I have some interesting people in my life and so <laughs> when i post certain things you'll, you'll post it and you don't even consider the fact that someone else is going to reinterpret it differently uh there was a something i posted with black history on it and one of my friends dad commented this is american history not just black history and my response to him was Man. you're right i guess i should have included that as my hashtag and left it left it as such yeah um but he and his son have publicly gone back and forth on social media about issues that they don't see eye to eye on. And I realize that that's just some people's nature is to, to give a, another perspective of a, of a reality. While it is the, another reality, it may not be the, um, the only truth. So yeah. it's, like, it's like saying um, we, should, we are all Americans <laughs> and we should all be able to pull, up our, um, pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. But the question is, you're you're thinking that i actually have boots yeah <laughs> yeah it's yeah. true so so you're saying pull up yourselves by the bootstraps you have boots i don't have any boots or if i do have boots now you're saying okay let's pull up ourselves by our bootstraps my boots don't have straps on them but yours yours has straps on them and so we just have to come figure out where we come into the conversation assuming that i can't make the assumption that you are all that that i see this is all part of the bigger issue too though mm -hmm. it's I assume something of you without getting the time to understand you. And that's the the core foundation of a lot of this is that, you know, I'm I'm not assuming the best in you or I'm not even asking you what it's like for you before I give my opinion all this stuff. And then you combine that with how um, sensitive people are that they can have a conversation that it they stand up for things on their computer but not have conversations in person with people. So you combined the sensitivity of everyone, how easily we get offended, how we can't have a conversation with somebody about it and get close to them. And all this stuff makes it really difficult when it's topics like race and, and gender and, and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, where do people even go from here? Where do people go from here? I think what's interesting is that one one thing we have one word we haven't really talked about is the word love, and so how do we approach our fellow person with love? Um, does it mean I will always like you? Maybe not. Does it mean I'll always like what you have to say? Perhaps I won't. But I I love you. I love you with the understanding that you are a human being, and as we talk about this uh, being neglected. What draws us to the underdog story? Why do we like to see the little person win? It's because innately inside of us, we love a great comeback. Mm -hmm. We love a great successful story. And so as we sit um, on the, in the neglected podcast, it's because there's a piece of love that's, that's somewhere in the midst of all this that says, while you may be uh, neglected, why you may be an outcast, why you may be pushed to the sidelines, I still see you. There's someone that still sees you. 
and we all have that in us like that's the thing i i like about this is like everyone's been neglected in some way so if you can acknowledge pain that you've experienced because someone has done something to you or they've forgotten you haven't seen you haven't wanted to hear about your story or your life like that's that's neglect so you know my wife and i were foster parents and so in fostering you've got abuse and neglect those are the two big reasons why a child will go into the foster care system well abuse is a lot easier to identify because um, it can be physical abuse it can be sexual abuse um, it's a lot easier to identify even emotional abuse because of, of the child's framework or what's you know parent is a psycho or something like that but there's a lot of kids that go into the foster care system because of neglect as well because there's just a whether it's like they've been neglected food, they haven't had food in the house, or they, it, it wasn't safe in there because they didn't have electricity or a bed to sleep on. And neglect sometimes can be a lot more subjective. What's neglect to you might not be neglect to somebody else. And so, but we've all been neglected. Some of us haven't been abused. I don't feel like I've necessarily been abused, but I believe everyone has had some form of neglect in their life where they felt, like you said, left out. And if you can acknowledge that, and see that maybe somebody else because of their their issues or something they're bringing up has felt that way too you can talk about that and come on a common ground of like yeah man i understand a little bit what that's like to feel that way maybe not in that context maybe i'm not going to agree with you on the border issue maybe i still don't understand race as much as i should but and if you feel neglected about that let's talk about that because i know i don't like that feeling and just being able to come to the table and have a conversation with somebody as opposed to being offended or having an agenda. That's the other thing. People just drop, drop the agenda. And that's the point of this podcast too. It's like, there's no agenda besides telling other people's stories who have experienced neglect in our community, in our culture, and allowing them to have a voice to do that. I think also when we look at neglected, we look at the emotional, mental, and spiritual trauma that's experienced and we can meet people there also. Mm -hmm. So while it may not be physical, here's some internal challenges that we have to overcome. And I believe, and I kind of want to make sure we hit this before we're, we're done today, is you and I have a similar background. I think that's why we connect very well is, you know, same ages, have kids the same age, same school, obviously. Kind of, we have a passion for racial reconciliation and healing and trying to find creative ways to do that. But we also come from a pastoral background where you, you got actual training. <laughs> I did not, but I still ended up becoming a pastor. We're both mentors and we, we live that lifestyle. And so we have the same, same heart for that. And so the question a lot of times comes up is the church's involvement with that. Bum, bum, bum. Bum, bum, bum. We need sound Because you and I producer. both know that one of, <laughs> one of the most segregated places oh, so good. is the church. Yes, so there is a song that goes directly to this that I heard last night um, in the new movie, uh, Kingdom and Rising, produced by Dr. Tony Evans. The artist Lecrae uh, actually has a song, and it's a verse in there that says, um, Sunday morning is the most segregated time, but it's also a quote lifted up from Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Mm -hmm. And so one of the challenges or one of the ways that the church and Christianity in particular um, has been embraced by or totally rejected by some is because of race. And so you have the mainline denominational churches that did not want slaves, blacks, people of color in their congregations at all. And so that's when you had this uh, birth of all these denominations that came out of um, already formed religions in America, but you have the influx of, or the creation of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church. You have the National Baptist Convention, the Progressive Baptist. Um, you have a sect of Presbyterians, Presbyterians who did not want to embrace uh, the change of slavery, uh, they wanted to keep slavery legal. Uh, there was an article that I read and it said that it, during one of the Presbyterian um, meetings, one of the pastors said that if we abolish slavery or if we agree with the 
abolishment of slavery, we will one infringe on the right of man to own property. And then we would allow for a group of people to enter into a race where they do not have the resources to compete. They will live in poverty, they will overpopulate, and it will get to a point in time when even the most kind-hearted person will not want to give to them. Mm. Uh, very prophetic words of a, a, a preacher of the gospel, a pastor, to say, because that's where we are now, we have we've entered into a time where there has been uh, a group of people who were not able to compete but the amazing piece is you had a group of people who were not able to compete yet entered into the race 200 years behind and have still been able to amass some level of of success which totally confuses folks of the majority culture because they're like how in the world we've done everything and so there's still systematic racism there's still religious racism there's still institutional relation institutional racism within religion uh and so the question then becomes what does the church do now and do we feel as if it's um that that do we feel that white uh denominations or predominantly white denominations should understand and recognize their privilege to then support uh help to leverage that exemplify the love of christ and the list goes on and on and on about what we can do, should do, or going to do. Well, my answer would be yes. And so I know, like, saying the phrase white privilege is, man, people can get crazy defensive and go off and feel <laughs> like you are, <laughs> you know, I worked hard, my granddaddy worked hard, and okay, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about that you haven't worked hard, or you, come, you came up from the slums and made something out of yourself. It, it has nothing to do with that. But talking about white privilege and, and, and all of that, even in the church culture, like people go crazy over it and don't want to talk about it. And uh, whether it's they feel guilty or it's, it's also messy, it's really messy to actually engage in this topic. And so for me, you know, coming from the church background and being a pastor and I'm, I'm out now, I'm still we're still doing that work. I'm just you're not in not the out. I'm not in the walls as much. You're I guess. not out. You're always in. Thank you for that creepy voice, Ephraim. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. But it's you know want to see racial reconciliation. But when you say what do the white people have to do? White pastors or white churches, they have to help lead it. In my opinion, you can agree or disagree. Black people cannot just be racially reconciled to white people unless white people lead the charge and say, we want to hear, we want this to happen. You can't have the one that's hurt be the one saying, we need to, we need to reconcile and we'll lead it and do it and force it. That the white church and the group, they have to be the ones to say, okay, we see it. We recognize it. What can we do about it? And to me, there's been there's been two major areas, and this is why we do this with our life, our family, that I see at the church is just missing the ball big time on as far as really impacting the community and showing that love that you're talking about. Okay, you want some of this stuff to be able to be talked about. People have to feel loved and feel that they have a place to be heard and that um, there's there's others, especially white people out there doing it. And a couple of places I feel like the ball is is being dropped that would make a big difference are taking care of the orphan and the widow and helping out with racial reconciliation. I think and those I, are two yeah. extremely messy things that, but if the church, especially white people step into and it's messy and it's going to take time, but they do that, you're going to see a lot of things happen that you can't just by posting something or by hoping a law does it or a politician does it or really anybody, because it takes time to do that and effort. I think uh, when you t use the term reconciliation, we have to also identify if there was ever a relationship to rec to reconcile. So part of this uh, conversation is under the banner of creating uh, multi-ethnic, multi-racial relationships. Mm -hmm. So if we even uh, enter the conversation there, we may get further than even saying, let's reconcile when perhaps there was never even a relationship to reconcile. Right, right. 
So the way that looked like for me, because that's a daunting thing, man. It's like, what do you, what do you even do with that? Because the problem is you can't just go up and do a sermon and then it's going to change stuff. You can't just go like, hey, let's have a conference at the Civic Center and let's make it half black, half white, or a third black, third white, third Latino, or people that aren't black and white, and let's all come together and talk about how important this is. And yes, we all agree. That doesn't change everyday life. That's just bringing everybody together, making you feel good about yourself. You can't have a sermon series for four weeks, tell everybody how important it is, and you need to step up and do something. You have to tangibly do it and change your heart and bring it in your life and in your home. So I think, you know, one of the ways that we tried to do that, and you were a part of that at the beginning too, was what do I do? I mean, wh what can you actually do that's gonna make an impact? And for us, it's just start small. Well, our foster can, our family can be a foster family. Model it that way. We can bring a small group of people from different churches into our home who are black, white, Latino, Asian, whoever, that are different, that want to learn from each other and, and grow. Maybe believe the same things, have the same faith, that's fine but we recognize that there's some messed up stuff out there and people aren't being loved and races are being neglected. So let's do it that way and grow for 10 weeks. And we use a curriculum called Be the Bridge just so we have a kind of a baseline thing to talk about that kind of stuff. But then that can grow and grow inside people's individual churches. But it has to be like small, it has to be grassroots, I guess is what I'm getting at. If it's not grassroots, it's not in people's homes, it's not in their lives and their hearts then a lot of stuff that we might even hear politically come up in this next election about you know, racial issues or reparations or black politicians, white politicians, or even gender issues or any of these other things. You know, it's a bunch of noise, but unless people are really taking the time to do it, um, can also be taken advantage of politically wise or financially wise to make money, all these different things, as opposed to you know, grassroots kind of changing hearts. You said a wonderful word. I'm so glad you lifted it up because that means I didn't have to do it. But this wonderful word of reparations, and we look at that and try to figure out what does that really mean? And I think part of it, and the reason why it's such a uh, daunting task is because there was conversation actually here in Savannah during the 1800s to say, hey, you do realize that we were, um, we want economic uh, mobility. We want to have some resources in order to come to the table. Remember the words of the Presbyterian pastor that said that, we're, we're allowing a group of people to enter into a race that they don't have the resources to compete in. And so part of this is around uh, land and financial resources and legacy. And there is a group of people that do not have that. They never had that opportunity to have these things. And so there was a group of pastors that met with the federal government in Savannah. There was a creation of the Freedmen's Bureau that would have allocated a certain amount of property and some resources for the exchange of uh, those black bodies serving in the military. And so um, this was something that was legislation that was drawn up and was getting ready to happen. And then there was a transition in administration. Folks end up dying. Some folks end up being assassinated. And this ceased to exist to kind of level the playing field. And I think that, that part of that was too, because they felt like these, these persons were infringing on their legacy, whatever legacy that they were trying to protect, whatever mm -hmm. history they're trying to protect. And so when you look at economic disparity, you can't talk about racism or we can't have the conversation about race reconciliation without uh, economic disparity. To go back to the point of being neglected, the kids that you are fostering will have uh, experienced some form of neglect. And so how can I know that you love me if I don't have any food in my mouth? How can I know that you love me and care about me if I don't have any water or shelter or clothing? Go back. It goes back to that um, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, but I don't have any boots. And so when we leverage the, when we begin to have conversations around leveraging and leveling the uh, economic disparity that we see, which is huge in Savannah, much more than we see in any other area. I believe if, if you can look up the uh, median income for families in Savannah or Chatham County, uh, I think it's somewhere around $41,000. Uh, and I think it's up from like $36,000 or something like that. But to raise a family of four on that level of money uh, and that doesn't, that's, that's the average. Yeah, I think it's up there. Coin is awesome. Nicely done, sir. There you go. So the median household income in Savannah is 55.352. And the poverty rate is at 17.3%. And when you take those numbers up a little bit more, when you look at that, stretch it out some more. And, um, and I think that number is actually being generous from uh, some of the newer research that's been 
that's been been coming out is that around um, business ownership or entrepreneurship, you'll find that there's a great disparity amongst um, those persons who are white that owns businesses and those persons who are black. And part of that is because these are generational businesses. These are businesses that were established uh, 100 plus years ago, and they've been able to pass that generational wealth from one generation to the next. And you may have a, a new entrepreneur that's coming into the game and they don't have as much time to have made the kind of money that the other person has had, or the other racial person. So when we talk about um, how we have the conversation around race relations, race reconciliation, and the neglected, how can I come to the table if I've been neglected, if I don't see the love that's coming from someone else that cares about me? You know the white people in church love and makes them feel good, speaking <laughs> for them and for myself, is when your church or people in your community are doing something for the black community. There's like an outreach. Oh, yeah. There's something, hey, we're passing out something. We're doing this, we're helping out. Uh, we feel good that some of our church money is being spent doing this, or we see people down there who are spending one Saturday afternoon a month to, to help out these kids or help out, you know, people that are in the projects or something like that. Or even in Africa, hey, we sent a team over there and it feel really good that we're helping out some, some African people or other people in other countries. We also feel really good when we see black people in a white church. I don't know if it's the same the other way around, but we feel really good. And we've talked about this where, you know, you've got predominantly white church and it feels really good to, in that, uh, that sea of salt, like we talk about to see, you know, the pepper or the brown sugar and some of those other items. We see some more seasoning in the building. We see some seasoning in there. We feel, we feel good. But what bothers me is that it's, it can be like a, just a mirage. You feel really good, but all that is, is an event. It's a Sunday service. It's an event to go serve those people. But that doesn't mean, like you said, that if you are in attendance for that service, that doesn't mean you're being invited in to any of those white people's homes to, to whatever, to have a Bible study, to have some type of small group, to just come over and, hey, have a meal. I saw you at church or something like that. But we feel good that we see it but that doesn't mean it's actually transpiring in the homes and in the hearts and people actually doing it. Because I don't like it when, you know, white people, whether it's a pastor or a politician or somebody, and they, they wave the flag of diversity. Hey, we're, we're diverse. Because we see, we see the seasoning in the sea of salt. So therefore what we're doing is diverse. But for someone who isn't white, and this is how, I would view it, especially after you know having friendship with you and other people. It's like, okay, I'm not just looking at the event. I'm looking at who's in charge, who's leading it. Right. Is your whole staff white? Is your you're people talking, making decisions you're talking good? Sir. Are they all white? Are the leaders all that kind of stuff? The influence. Do we have a seat at the table? We, we're sitting in your your sanctuary, but do we have a seat at the table? And one, just to hear us, and then two to to have a voice. And so that's the thing that bothers me because we have a false sense of security and diversity, I think. And you know, you, you're at a predominantly black church, so I'd love to hear your perspective on both of those sides of it. <clears throat> so um, I'm, I'm really, I was sharing this uh, conversation with my parents uh, recently. It's, I, I'm a, a really nice mix of an ecumenical blend of denominations and <laughs> You know, you're talking to the kid that uh, went to an Episcopalian preschool. Uh, my grandmother is Presbyterian, and I ended up going to a Presbyterian seminary. My father was a Pentecostal elder. My godfather was a Pentecostal uh, pastor. And then we went to the Baptist church where I was raised between two different congregations. One was a National Baptist Convention Baptist church, and the other one was a Progressive Baptist uh, and I only know all of this because I started doing research and studying my background and all this kind of stuff. Oh, you're making my head hurt, I man. Know. Isn't it wonderful? <laughs> yeah. You, this you're well seasoned. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have a lot of seasoning. <laughs> um, and so with, with bringing all that to the, to the, to the table um, for conversation, you know, it helps me to see, okay, where is, where is Jesus in the midst of all of that? And so I'm kind of, I kind of have, labeled myself just as a Jesus follower at this point. You know, um, I believe 
um, that this is the love that we have to convey and that we have to demonstrate if we're going to to grow. Um, and so I'm very sensitive to going into a predominantly white church and walking in as the as a token or walking as uh, walking in very alone and being painfully aware that I'm the only black dude in the building or in the service or on the program. Um, but understanding that I'm coming under the uh, um, under the power of God and with the permission of God to be to be there. Um, and so we have to be aware of how we're coming to the table, but also why am I here at the table and what's going to happen after we get up from the table? Are we just going to go back to our own lives and you're going to go back to your house? I go back to my house right. and we we'll go back to, with our own opinions and live happily ever after in our own own places. Um, because in order for us to really be on one accord, you have to listen to the painful reality of of what's going on around you. I was asked by a pastor one time, are we afraid to do ministry beyond our events? And I chuckled and I said, yes, we're afraid. And they they pushed me a little bit more. Like, why did you say that? Because it's messy. We don't want to follow kids from Sunday service to their homes to, def to find out that they're neglected. We don't want to move past that wonderful experience of feeling good where we wrote a check for some charitable organization to really discover why we have to write a check. You know, if we're gonna, it goes back to my statement about economic disparity and um, leveling that. Are we will, really willing to help people create jobs? Are we, do we want to eliminate um, hunger? Because there's a there's a dollar amount associated with hunger. I don't know where that is, but there's a dollar amount on hunger. <laughs> so. How can we eradicate hunger? That would be a help. How can we eradicate poverty? Not being poor, but living in poverty, which is a mentality of I don't have, I can't have, I won't, I won't be able to have. So in our in our small group where we talk about these racial issues and faith and stuff like that, the biggest word that was a struggle for everybody was reparations. Because that's a real that doesn't get used at all. Like, and if it does. There's neg negative connotations associated with it, especially you know, white community a lot of times. It, it looks like it's estimated that uh, to, to completely end world hunger would cost about $30 billion a year. Um, that's what the UN estimates. But then you have to make sure that money's being used yep. to do that. Yeah, I mean, you know, we have lottery winnings, right? Mm -hmm. Like people with all this money, we have some people who have like Thirty billion dollars is technically not a lot of money for no, no, for sure not. What we have 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 y'all seen uh, Trigger Warning, the Killer Mike uh, Netflix special? No, but he's big on this. Type so of he uh, he does uh, his, the first episode of it is he goes to Macon, and uh, the whole episode is nothing about him, only shopping and consuming and, and everything uh, African American. Uh, originated products nice. so from grocery stores to his haircut um, he don't even smoke weed because the majority of it now is grown by white guys or comes from Mexico and so um, he cuts out everything that's not an African-American made product or business or establishment and wow. stuff like that and it's amazing to see uh, how hard it really is to find uh, find you know that type of thing even in an area that is predominantly uh, an African American area, uh, the area of Macon that he goes to yeah. to shoot that part of the special. So that's interesting, man. And that goes back to something else I want to uh, share too is that when we see folks with all this jewelry and clothing and shoes, expensive expensive stuff, uh -huh. it, it doesn't mean that that is a representation of what's going on at the at the house. Well, I can tell you, you know? it's not right now. <laughs> Because yeah, I go to right. my boy's right. homes. Yeah, yeah, he's got a brand new pair of Jordans on, but he's like, I I haven't eaten lunch in three days. Right. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It goes but you got to dig deeper. You got to yeah. get involved in somebody's life. And, and part of it is too, if I can look good, I just have to present well. And that's what folks have done a long time is present very well. But there's a whole nother backstory. Um, even as we look at going back to economic uh, stability and economic disparity, you can take a family of four 
One family could be white, the other family could be black. They could have the same profession, the same degrees. And when you look at the interest loan, the interest rate for the white family is gonna be lower than interest rate for the black family. Sure. And so you see then that this is not sustainable wealth building because the family, the black family is getting in more debt paying for the same house in the same neighborhood, same make and model as the other, as the white family. And the white family probably had more money to put down on the property than the black family did because the, the family may have come from means where the mother, the grandfather, the whomever may be able to say, here's a, a gift to you of 15, 20, $30,000 to put on your brand new home versus the family who um, is the first uh, college graduate, the, the first one to move out of the projects, mm -hmm. to buy a house. This is something that the family system has never seen before because all the other homes have been rented. And so now you have this uh, family here, but they look the same on paper or they look the same based on what your eye can see. But when you peel back what's going on behind it, it's, it's, a, it's a totally different story. So that touches a little bit with when I was about to talk about reparations a little bit. It's like, man, what does that mean? What would that happen? And for me, it's always about making things personal. It's like not waiting for the government, the president, your, your councilman to do something for you. If there's people that are hurting and neglected, you can do something about it as opposed to, man, I wish, I wish somebody would just make a law. Well, there was also a law that desegregated and didn't do a whole lot for race relations either. So relying on government or even, you know, a pastor or a church or something, I just wish they would do it. I just wish somebody else would do it besides me. And it always has to be brought back to yourself, mm -hmm. right? There's okay. people in your life that are, that are neglected. There's people racially and, and what they belief system or their gender, whatever it is that are neglected. And going back to that idea of um, reparations for me, even making that personal is like, okay, it doesn't necessarily even have to mean finances all the time. It's, it's opportunity. It's what can I give someone that I have the ability to give them that they haven't had before. Just even being a white guy who's privileged and can even do a show like this. And it just came together because of connections I had. I'm glad to know you. Thank you for your connections. <laughs> but but it's it's giving somebody a, a voice or you go listen to them or you bring them into your home and hear and and how can you personally help them out, whether it's money or it's just an opportunity or it's a job connection or it's something recognizing, man, God has given me certain abilities and qualities and privileges that other people don't have as opposed to just being defensive and I didn't do any of that slavery stuff or I didn't do any of that segregation stuff or I didn't do any of that Ferguson stuff or whatever it is and being defensive and having an opinion about everything, using my time, resources and my family and my home and all that stuff to actually help someone else out as opposed to just pointing out what isn't and isn't wrong and giving my opinion on it. And that's what really my hope is for even this is giving people a voice so that people that are neglecting people that are neglected have an avenue to now know what to do at least and go out there and try it and say well i don't i don't know what can i do we want to shine a light on that here's even small things you can do i like it man well let's keep shining and you're part of that man well, i'll keep on shining man. but i got a couple questions for you for we questions for we oh my goodness yeah we'll keep them keep them short and quick here but Quinn, um, what are we doing <laughs> what questions well, it's not going to be too hard. Man. All right, let's It'll see. be all right. All right. So one of them was, if you could be any other race or nationality for like a week, you don't even have to say the reason why, but just like, who would you who would you want to live like and experience in, in a different different skin or culture? I'll make up something because I really would not want to be anybody else or any other culture or ethnicity. <laughs> I love everything about being black. Good. But uh, I would uh, want to go over to India and um, sit at the feet of Mah Mahatma Gandhi just to hear and listen. That's legit. That's cool. By you, Quinn? Um, it would be, it would probably be. Uh, Something, something similar. I think I, I'd want to do um, someone of Arabic descent. Mm. Uh, I just, I'm fascinated by um, the faith associated with their uh, lifestyles there, and 
uh, in particular, the interaction between Western culture and Eastern culture and how, you know, I, I, I just think that the perspective that, that we have on a lot of them and that they have on a lot of us, uh, um, it's just com- completely built on uh, really lack of education, I think, you know, and, and I would, <clears throat> I would definitely want to see life from, from the perspective of someone uh, on that side of the world for sure. That's cool, man. How about you? How about you? I want to be black, man, for a week. Um, I'd like to split the week if I had to, but I'd like to have a week of like a uh, black in America and uh, like Africa. I just like that. Just to see, man. Just to see. And I'd want to go into like different kind of, if I could, different kind of cultures and settings. Like you were talking about, just be a black man and walk into a predominantly white church or walk, you know, go to a, go someplace where I was not majority Mm -hmm. and see what reactions are. Yeah. You know what I mean? Even, I I wouldn't go too fast, but even just like speeding or doing something and like, you know, what, what is the fear of getting even pulled over compared to, to being white where you don't even think anything about it, you know, just stuff like that, where again, putting yourself in somebody else's shoes to understand uh, who they are, I think is, would be a cool thing to do. Yeah, for sure. But since we can't, having conversations like this is the best way to learn how to do that. So finally, Cornelius, what can people that are listening to this uh, are going to listen to it? What what can they do, especially if they are, you know, dare I say it, privileged or they're white or they're, they're someone who doesn't have to face um, issues that some other people do, people of different skin color, different beliefs or and things like that what what can someone like me listening to this hearing your story and the the needs that are out there what can i tangibly do to affect um either change or just being being love out there to somebody who isn't experiencing it i think um tangible what can you do tangibly and i think love is tangible so what can you do you can love wholeheartedly does it mean that you are required to give all of your riches away, maybe, but being open to understand that you are positioned and privileged to change. And so there's this uh, proverb uh, and saying, uh, be the change you want to be the change you want to see. And so what is it that you want to see different? And are you open enough to hear from someone else who needs to see change? We need to sit at the table to understand that um relationship building effective communication uh, an economic awareness being wholeheartedly available to hear and then willing to do whatever that looks like for you whatever that looks like in um joshua joshua 1 9 says uh, be courageous very courageous and so here you have joshua getting ready to go into the unknown front and i think that when we look at race relations we look at dealing with people it's an unknown front i only know what i see but when i get to know you there may be another narrative another story another level of experience exposure that you have had and so it's my responsibility at that point to to be courageous enough to see you Mm -hmm. uh, courageous enough to hear you and then courageous enough to love you it's good man yeah it's a good way to end that and how can people get a hold of you if they have any uh, questions or want to contact you, email, social media? Yeah, what, what I'm, I'm on every social media platform, I believe. I'm, I'm on um, Facebook, Cornelius J. E. Lloyd. And uh, you can find me on Twitter at C. J. E. Lloyd and Instagram, C. J. E. Lloyd. So any of those. And then if you want to send me an email, C. J. E. Lloyd at gmail.com. Fantastic. Well, appreciate you being our very first guest on the Neglected Podcast. And the cool thing is people will be hearing from you too. You're going to be uh, occasionally co-hosting and stuff like that too. So you'll be around and people get a lot more of Ephraim than uh, hopefully they're ready for. I thank you so much for having <laughs> me. It's a pleasure being with you. I look forward to coming back. Sounds good, man. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Quinn, our producer. Yes, sir, thank you yes, for sir. City Church for, yep. for hosting us. Such a sweet setup, man. It's really cool. You can uh, get in contact with me at nick at excel, X-C-E-L, today.com. 
or social media, it's uh, Schultzy Time. And we'll probably put that on the screen there too, Schultzy Time. Schultzy Time. At Schultzy Time. So, and if you have any questions about the podcast, or um, you can go to For the Neglected. It's at For the Neglected on all, our, all of our social media. If you have any guests you think would be good for us to interview or any questions you have, it's uh, info at the neglected.org. Appreciate y'all. Have a good one. And uh, we need like a ending catchphrase. I'm like, don't neglect yourself or something. Is that good? What was <laughs> All right. Don't neglect yourself. We'll get a better one next time. Let's go. With it. All right, man. Peace. <laughs> Peace. All right.